Welcome, glad that you're with us today or wherever you're joining us online, one of our churches, patio, parent viewing rooms here in this room, glad that you are with us. Hopefully you brought uh, your uh, doubts and your skepticism and questions and, and all of that because we're going to be taking on, you know, what about faith and science? And hopefully we'll be able to address uh, uh, maybe, maybe some of the concerns or questions that uh, you have had or someone that you care about has had that maybe has caused us, sometimes questions can do this, caused us to sort of take a little step back from this whole God thing. And, and if that's you, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be open to it. Um, we're going to cover a number of things. I've got about 30 minutes here, and all I intend to do is completely resolve all the issues surrounding evolution, age of the earth, uh, who is the creator, um, what about the Big Bang, and where did the dinosaurs go? I'm just going to take it all on, and you're just going to be amazed. Yeah, right. You know, I, I do have a confession to make before I get going and, you know, talking about, about science. I'm not a scientist. I know that's shocked some of you. But uh, no, I'm not a scientist, but what I have done is some great research, and I've given you a bibliography at the end of the uh, uh, outline there, and I encourage you to dig in. There are some great websites. There are some fabulous uh, books, and I think that you'll agree with me that there is an amazing uh, faith affirmation in the discovery. I don't think we need to be uh, at, at war with science, and this whole idea of, of faith though it can be misunderstood as well. We can get the idea that we're being uh, asked to, to believe without thinking, and, and that's certainly not the case. One little boy went to church, he got home, and his dad said, what did you learn? And he said, well, we learned about faith. And he says, well, what's faith? He stopped and he thought, he says, well, faith, faith is, is believing something that you know is not true. And, and sometimes when we start dealing with this issue of, of scientific research and, and, and what uh, evidences are out there, and then, but have faith, well, I, I want to have faith in God, but, you know, I kind of, the numbers are adding up over here. And, and so you're not quite sure what, what to do with all that. Perhaps the little boy missed the point, but for some people, when it comes to faith, that tension really does exist. I think for many, really. I think sometimes we feel like faith is, is just always colliding with uh, science. Karen Armstrong is uh, a woman, she's a Roman Catholic nun who deconverted and now she's none. So she was a, a nun, now she's none. She was an NUN, now she's N-O-N-E. So uh, none of the above. She's super smart. Uh, maybe you've seen her on some TED Talks. She's, she's great. She wrote a book called The Case for God and she said this. Many of us have been left stranded with an incoherent concept of God. We learned about God at about the same time as we were told about Santa Claus. While our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomena evolved and matured, our theology remains somewhat infantile. Not surprisingly, when we uh, attained intellectual maturity, many of us rejected the God we had inherited and denied that he existed. So now you, you look at this and you say, okay, we grow up with a certain understanding about God or scripture or whatever, and it doesn't mature. And so life and information that comes to you can begin to jar some of that, and, and that's reasonable. And so you've got these uh, adult questions, and the people around you, the only answers you're getting are sort of a uh, immature faith response to your adult questions. <laughs> And, and, and that can be problematic. It, it needs to, to go beyond that. You need, um, for fact-based questions, you're not looking for faith-based answers. You, you want to have something that, that is explainable. This series really is all about the gods that maybe we have had in our mind based on how we were brought up, what we believe, that don't really exist. Uh, for example, I've got a number of them I found in various places that I thought described it very well. Next week, we're going to be taking on the first one, and it's called Bodyguard God. Bodyguard God always keeps you safe. Bodyguard God, He loves you, and He'll never let anything, you know, bad happen to you. And that's a great, wonderful God to uh, have and right up until life happens, right until you're getting your butt kicked, and then you're going, what about Bodyguard God? 
What happened to bodyguard God? He's not around. And so you come to the place where you go, I guess he doesn't exist. And you're right. He doesn't exist. And then there's on-demand God. On-demand God, he responds to fair and selfless requests as we would. You know, it's reasonable. So I think it's a reasonable request. So I think, you know, that on-demand God is going to you know, honor this request. For example, you know, God, I'm not asking you to change the world. I would just like a date. Uh, can, can you do this? Or, or really not even a date for me, a date for my son or my daughter. Or really, it'd be great, great if they just got married and gave me grandchildren, but that's about me, so let's just put it at the date. You know, it, it's this idea of I asked God for something, I didn't hear anything. I, I needed a sign, I didn't see anything. I wanted a miracle, nothing. And so you go, I guess God doesn't exist. Well, you're right, on-demand God, he's not real. And then there's boyfriend God or girlfriend God. And boyfriend God is always there. His presence is always, I always feel boyfriend God's presence and his, his arms are around me all the time. And I just feel, feel him. Just always feel him. And then the feelings go away. And you're going, what happened to God? I used to feel your presence, God, and now you're not around. So I guess you don't exist. I guess you're gone. Yeah, okay, true. Because boyfriend God, he doesn't exist. If you're going to be looking for this experience to um, constantly confirm whether God is with you or loves you, you're going to find out that he doesn't because he doesn't exist and you need to discover the real God. And then there's guilt God. Now, guilt God, he controls you by making you feel bad. You feel bad and you know you're unworthy. Guilt God knows what you did last summer uh, and he didn't like it. Uh, Guilt God, guilt God is the God who is love, but he doesn't really like you. You know, it's just like whatever, you know, and you're never good enough. You know, no matter how hard you try, you're going to fail at some point and guilt God will be right there. Guilt God is a bummer and he doesn't exist. See, I, I'm hoping that, that one of the things we'll get a little glimpse of today is that that God is the awesome creator and a completely gracious redeemer. That's who he really is. But as we get into it, I want to talk about another God, and it's the anti-science God. Now, the anti-science God, he wants to force us to choose between undeniable science on one hand and unreliable religion on the other. We have to choose between those two, and there you go. And maybe you grew up with that when the message that you grew up with was uh, you had questions about this. Well, I don't understand this. And finally, they didn't have answers. So they just said, well, stop thinking and start believing. That's a really bad option. If you have to, you know, flush your brain before you come into church, that, that's just not going to really work for you as you grow and mature and as you learn. You know, for some of us, you... you maybe grew up in a religious environment of some kind, and then you went to a non-religious environment, like college, and you liked it a lot. And your questions that began to grow, and then you had other answers that were not faith-based, but fact-based, and so you were having to deal with this whole idea. Well, uh, one of the probably loudest critics over the last couple of decades uh, for Christianity and faith in God has been a guy named Richard Dawkins. Uh, pretty famous atheist, died recently, but he nailed it when he said this. One of the truly bad effects of religion is that it teaches us that it is a virtue to be satisfied with not understanding. That somehow just believing is really a good thing. And I, I think that uh, we don't have to make that choice, God or science, because we, we, we choose both all the time. If you're a Christian, you're a parent, uh, let's just say your kid gets really sick, I mean super sick, and you load them in the car, and what do you do? You take them immediately to the church. No. You take them to the doctor. That's what you do. And then the doctor looks at them and says, oh, we're not sure what's wrong here. We're going to run some tests. We're going to draw some blood, and we'll, you know, should have the results tomorrow. So you're waiting by the phone, and you're, you've got your friends praying, and then you get the call. The doctor says, well, we've, we've um, run the tests and we've got the labs back. And what we've concluded is that God is trying to teach you something. No way you don't want to hear that. 
You want to hear some real world solutions to this real world problem. How are you going to fix my kid? Don't, don't try to make this something that it is not. God may be trying to teach me something, but I really want to hear that from you right now. I want to know what the prescription is. So we, we do this God and science thing all the time. Well, in this series, here's been the invitation we've looked at every week. You can jot this down if you're taking notes. Will you follow where the evidence leads, not where you hope it leads? Sometimes the idea of following where the evidence leads is, is like, okay, I, I'm willing to do this. Maybe you'd say, I don't believe. But there's a big difference between I don't believe it and I don't want to believe it. I don't want it to be true. Then there's some emotion. Then there is maybe even some hurt back there, and you're still angry at God. So, I, you know, I don't want this God thing, I don't want that answer to work for me, because I'm still ticked about that back there, that happened, that where you didn't show up, where this happened to me, where fill in the blank. And so if, if you find yourself in that kind of a place, I would just ask you to, um, you know, sort of suspend judgment on this for a few more minutes, and consider that God is great and his love for you is greater. He cares for you. Even if you don't want to hear that, if you don't want to believe it, consider it just for a few minutes. Our verse that uh, has been our theme verse is Hebrews 11.1. 1. So we're going to read this with our outside voices. If you're out on the patio, we expect to have you rattle that wall over there. And uh, in here, we, let's, let's do it big and proud. Ready? Go. Now, faith is confidence in what? Oh, wait. <clears throat> that was terrible. Okay. So we'll try it one more time. Ready? Go. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Well, wait a minute. This faith thing, is, that sounds kind of hard. You know, it, I'm not going to completely see it all, but there is evidence. There, is, there are clues along the way, and, and I think you'll get the point of this in just a minute. Look at Psalms 19. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a, a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has got his fingerprints all over this thing. And, and he's, he's giving us clues. And he wants us to pursue him. He's pursuing us and he wants it to be reciprocal. But you see, he's not making us do it. He's drawing us. He's inviting us. And then we have to determine how we're going to respond as he is drawing us. Well, you might look at some of this stuff and go, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I kind of... Hope it's true, I want to believe, but I got to tell you, I got some problems with some of this Bible stuff. Like uh, six days of, to create the universe. I got a problem with that, six days. Now, if you're uh, taking a, um, a literalist approach to scripture and um, you're saying, okay, yeah, six days, and then um, we did the genealogy and how many years and a generation, and we tracked it all back and we've determined that the earth is 6,000 years old. And that all of the fossil record and the geology, God just did it in a miracle and kind of crunched it all together, but it's 6,000 years old. And that, that's one approach. Science, on the other hand, says it's a slightly larger number, about four and a half billion years old, which I'm not a math guy, but that's a bigger number. Okay, uh, <laughs> a lot bigger number. And so you go, well, I have to choose. Is it four and a half billion or is it 6,000? I have to choose. Is it creation? Or is the universe really just self-perpetuating? How does this work? Well, I think sometimes we can miss uh, some wonderful clues that God has given. For example, in the Hebrew language, there are not a lot of nouns. And so the, the nouns that they have, they gotta kinda use them two and three and four times for various shadings of meaning. For example, the word yom, Y-O-M, in Hebrew, is the word day. And it can mean a day, 24 hours. It could also mean just daylight hours. Another meaning is a finite period of time with the beginning and end, but it could be any amount of time. It could be a long 
period of time. And it's a day. And we see in scripture, many times it's used that way to the Lord, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. That, that kind of thing is not a big issue for God. So the idea here is these were the steps. This was the process of creation. Here's what happened in each of these days. But the time period doesn't have to be a 24-hour period. And it can still be a proper, what's called a hermeneutic or study of Scripture to view it either way. Now, if you want to say, no, I'm going to believe it's 6,000 years and he did it by a miracle, okay, way to go. Fine, he could have. I mean, he's God, I wasn't there. But on the other hand, it's reasonable to also say, I think the science is objective and, and, and that makes sense how that could work. You see, I, I have found the science to be very faith affirming. To be able to come to it and say, huh, so that's how God did it. Cool. Rather than let it rock my faith, I just assume, I start with the premise that God is real, God is the creator. That's my premise, not necessarily yours. But then when I am bump into something that would challenge that, I don't just assume that the science is wrong or that the Bible is wrong, that, but maybe Mike doesn't get it yet. And so I need to dig into this a little bit more. And, and I hope that you would take a, a similar approach. So then you've got you know, evolution and you've got, well, what about, you know, if you're gonna say, well, I believe in evolution, well, what do you do with the Cambrian explosion? The Cambrian explosion of species where all of a sudden in this period of, of history, it, science proves they just showed up. All of, all of these creatures just were there and they didn't follow a pattern of evolution. And then what do you do with the fossil record? Well, they said this became that, but there's no transitional fossils. There, there should be thousands of transitional fossils of all of these favorable mutations. And, and it's something that is, that, is, that is known within the science community. Matter of fact, here's one of the really smart guys I'm gonna quote, not, not a believer, he is a uh, evolutionary biologist by the name of Stephen Jay Gould, and he said this, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists, persists as the trade secret of paleontology. Now that sentence right there, some of you are going wah, 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 wah. Hang in. The evolutionary tree that adorns our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. So they have little pieces of information and they're saying we filled in the gaps what we think happened. Well, that word inference to me also sounds a lot like faith. So everybody's using faith in this process, folks, wherever you land on it. So three questions I've got for us. The first one is this, the cosmological question, what caused everything that exists? The universe either had a um, a personal or an impersonal cause. Either an infinite God created the universe or the universe is self-existent. It just appears. Something came first though, God or matter. And, and I'm not saying we're gonna prove this today. That, that, that's not it at all. We'll take the available data and determine the, uh, the reasonable probability. We do that all the time. We, we live in the world of reasonable probability and if you're looking for absolutes, you're gonna be disappointed a lot, whether it's science or faith. We have confidence. The Bible says that we can have confidence. It doesn't say we're gonna have assurance. He will assure us, but you see, it's in that connection of faith. We can be very confident. Even if there isn't an absolute proof, here's the positive proof, I've got it all written down, you know, I've got, you know, Jesus' uh, picture in my wallet, he sent it to me, you know, it's, you're just not going to get that. Okay, so, so what are the clues then? What's the reasonable probability clues? Well, first of all, the, the evidence shows now that the universe had a beginning point. There is a clear beginning point for the universe. About 100 years ago, uh, Hubble began to question as he was looking at this expanding universe, wait a minute, I think there was a starting point here. And then about 50 years ago, a couple of guys found sort of an echo of a big explosion. And they got the Nobel Peace Prize for it, it's called the Big Bang Theory. And 
the Big Bang Theory really rocked the Christian world because uh, many scientists were saying this proves the whole creation thing's a myth. This proves that no God. I, I think just the opposite. There had to be matter that exploded. Where'd the matter come from? So that's how God did it. Through a big bang. Awesome. That would have been fun to see. I'm going to review that tape when I get to heaven. That will be good. See, this, this, um, this big bang just goes, and it's still expanding. The universe is continuing to expand. But one of the other things that they've discovered now is that it's starting to wind down. So there was a beginning, and there's going to be an end. It's, it's going to be a while, so don't stop, you know, making your mortgage payments. So, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to get through this now. <laughs> You'll be in trouble. Um, so there was a beginning. There will be an end to all of this. And it, that does not prove God. But it is a really good clue. A really good clue. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, an, another clue is what's called the anthropic principle, which is the, the fine-tuning of the universe. It, it appears as though that the universe, and especially as we get now to this planet, has been fine-tuned to support human life, that it's like made for it. It's, it's fine-tuned. And, and, and there's so many variables that had to be fine-tuned that if even, even one of those variables was off, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, another smart dude named uh, Francis Collins, he was the uh, director of the Human Genome Project. He was the guy that oversaw the mapping of the human genome, okay? Bright fellow. Uh, he wrote a, a book called The Language of God. It would be the one, if you're gonna read only one of those books on the list, read that book, okay? It's awesome. Here's what he said. When you look from the perspective of a scientist at the universe, it looks as if we knew, uh, it knew we were coming. There are 15 constants, the gravitational constant, various constants about strong and weak nuclear force, et cetera, that have precise values. If any one of those constants was off by even one part in a million, or in some cases by one part in a million million, the universe could not have actually come to the point where we see it. Matter would not have been able to coalesce. There would have been no galaxies, stars, planets, or people. In sum, our universe is wildly improbable. Huh. And then on the flip side, a uh, rather famous, brilliant uh, physicist, atheist by the name of Stephen Hawking, he said this about that subject. If the rate of expansion one second after the big boom had been smaller by even one part in 100,000 million millionths, I don't know how they math this up, but that's awesome. The universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present size into a hot fireball. The odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think there are religious implications. Pretty astounding that he makes that statement. This anthropoly, uh, anthro, anthrop, you get it, that principle, that, that uh, the universe is, is designed, it's fine-tuned for human life. That doesn't prove God, but it is a huge clue. It's a huge clue. Psalms 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? In uh, January, my wife Carmen and I were, went out to Borrego Springs and um, spent the night there so that we could watch the lunar eclipse. It was awesome. It was just amazing to stand out there and, and watch as this shadow of the earth passes in front of them and the moon goes dark and you, you watch it happen a little time. And then just the stars and, and to stand out there in the desert and to just go, God, you're amazing. Look at this. And you care for me? That's, that is just so humbling and so awesome. 
And, you know, I've talked with people and go, well, there, there are billions of people on the planet and there's been billions before. You're saying God cares for each one individually. Uh, yeah, look what he made. He can do that. He, he can do stuff, man, I'm telling you. He's amazing. He's God. And he's bad in a good way. And, and he loves you. And he cares for you. Second question. The moral question. What caused humanity's desire for morality and meaning? C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote, by the way, the, the second book, maybe the first one, ooh, it's hard to say, Mere Christianity. Uh, it's on the list. It is another great book. Been around for a long, long time. And the first section of it is titled, Right and Wrong as a Clue to the meaning of the universe. And Lewis demonstrates that there is a universal sense of morality in every culture, a universal sense of what is right and wrong. Everybody has it. Now, it's even, it's, and it's hardwired. It seems to be a part of human beings. So what if God's not there? What does that make you? Well, Another great scientist by the name of uh, Carl Sagan, he said this, we are cosmic accidents. That's all we are. We're just cosmic accidents. Well, one of the clues that sort of pushes back on that is this idea of morality, this sense of right and wrong that is hardwired in to human beings. Well, how did that happen? Why is that? I want to suggest that it's because we're created in the image of God. That there's something in us that's drawn to this. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Morality is not universal. Well, okay. Different cultures maybe have a different standard of what's right and wrong, but everyone has one. Everyone has one. You might disagree with theirs, but everyone has one. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He has set eternity in the human heart. He has set in your heart and my heart a sense of right and wrong. And we are drawn to be connected to the source of that morality. We are drawn to it. There's a want to. You know what that want to is called? faith. If you have a want to, then you're being drawn. It's a good thing. Philosopher Immanuel Kant in the 1700s, German guy said this, two things fill me with constantly increasing admiration and awe the longer and more earnestly I reflect on them. The starry heavens without and the moral law within. So he's saying, man, I've got these two great clues, the two great evidences that are blowing my mind, the universe and what is happening in here. You know, that, that's that evidence of things we cannot see, yet we know are there. We're drawn to it. Number three, if the evidence leads to a God of love, how will you respond? What do you do with this? What difference does this make? I don't believe that church and science need to be in conflict. Science tells me what happened and faith tells me why. The why behind it is you. God loves you. God wanted to love you and he created a space and place where it could happen. But it's important to understand that this is not a science textbook. And whenever the church has tried to make this a science textbook, it has not gone well. 1632, a guy named uh, Galileo, uh, Galileo, not Leo DiCaprio, um, Galileo, he um, uh, had a little theory. I, I think that the earth revolves around the sun, not the sun around the earth. And the religious community said, you're a heretic. 
And they pulled him in front of uh, the inquisition that was going on at the time. He uh, ended up uh, in house arrest for the last 10 years of his life. Huh. You know why he was a heretic? Because of Psalms 104. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. So the earth cannot be moved, so therefore it can't be rotating around the sun. They made the Bible a science textbook rather than understanding it was a, a, a bit of poetry to talk about how secure we are and that God is keeping it all together. And, it was, and they twisted something that was supposed to be beautiful and, and used it to pound their dogma down everyone's throat. The Bible is not a science book. And the point of the Bible is not even the Bible. The point of the Bible is a person who wants to connect with us in a relationship of love. Okay, Captain Genome, Francis Collins, one more time. Listen to this. In this modern era of cosmology, evolution, and the human genome, is there still the possibility of a richly satisfying harmony between the scientific and the spiritual worldviews? I answer with a resounding yes. In my view, there is no conflict in being a rigorous scientist and a person who believes in a God who takes a personal interest in each one of us. In the, in the beginning, God created. And, and above earth and, and above uh, the universe and above all creation is the creator. God is not the universe. He's the creator of the universe and he's different from his creation. He is higher than his creation. Don't mix the two up. One more verse, Nehemiah 9, 6. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. The universe is fundamentally personal because God is personally interested in you. Now, hopefully you'll read uh, Genesis, at least the first couple of chapters of Genesis, and it gives the, this whole creation account. Uh, but listen, just listen to this, not on your outline, Here's day seven at the end of it. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God's work of creation is complete. So he, 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 he creates man and then he rests. No new species. It's interesting how that follows science. Now, certainly there's adaptation because um, animals adapt to their environment, okay? It happens all the time. When you come here, many of you bring a sweater. It's adaptation, all right? <laughs> Days one through six, when you read this, you'll, you'll hear this phrase. It was, it, was, uh, it was daytime and it was evening, day one, and then... Next description, next day. it was daytime and it was evening, day two. It goes through the whole thing until day seven. It doesn't say it was daytime and evening and, why? Because we're in it. We're in day seven still. It's one of those finite seasons, epochs of time. And God's saying, I have entered into my rest and we learn from scripture, he is inviting us into his rest. He's inviting us into relationship. Oh, the natural world is fine-tuned for life, but God has brought with it the spiritual world, which is fine-tuned for relationship. And we don't have to wait until the by and by. It's not just somewhere off in eternity. It's now. I want to invite you to, to, to listen to a song and reflect and would you take this just few moments to consider your response to a God who loves you completely? Thank you. the beginning. 
your point of reference You spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath Hill you create.